like to welcome all of you. My name is Jackie Schreier. I am the uh, director of the Jewish Federation of Fort Wayne. And we appreciate all of you who are in attendance here uh, to hear our speaker, Mark Levine. Uh, those who were here earlier know that he uh, will do a very excellent job. Fran, who and our president of the uh, Federation of Fort Wayne, will introduce Mark in just a moment. But I would like to make sure that you all had something to eat or drink. We want you to feel completely nourished before we start the program. We also received, um, we also have uh, at the back sign up where if you would like to receive regular emails or correspondence from the Jewish Federation for events or lectures, please sign up and we will make sure that you are invited. There's also forms back there if you would like to become a member of the Jewish Federation. We would absolutely welcome you. This Pathways to Peace lecture is made available by the Dr. Harry W. Salen Foundation and the Jewish Federation. So thank you again, and now I would like to ask Fran Adler to come and introduce to this evening's speaker. Thank you. my pleasure also to welcome you all here this evening and thank you for coming. Mark Levy has been covering the Middle East as a news correspondent, analyst, and author since he moved to Israel in 1972. Most of his work has been in radio news, starting as an anchor and reporter for Israel Radio's English language news service and continuing as Middle East correspondent for radio networks including NPR, NBC, Mutual, and CBC in Canada. In 1984, he won the New York Overseas Press Club's Lowell Thomas Award for Best Radio Interpretation of Foreign Affairs. He recently wrapped up 15 years with the Associated Press, where he served as a reporter and editor for the news agency's print service and Middle East correspondent for AP Radio and its 850 stations in North America. In 2009, he began splitting his time between AP's Jerusalem Bureau and its Cairo Regional Hub. He moved to Cairo in 2011 and lived there for two years, experiencing Arab Spring firsthand. His book, Broken Spring, is based on those experiences. Born and raised in Fort Wayne, Mark graduated from Southside High School and from Indiana University with a degree in political science in 1969. More than 40 years covering the news in Israel have included many exciting and emotional moments. One highlight was broadcasting live from the Israel-Jordan border as Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Jordan's King Hussein signed a peace treaty. In contrast, on the night where Bean was assassinated, Mark recalls driving in a daze from his house outside Tel Aviv to Jerusalem for a news conference at the official residence of Israel's president in the middle of the night, realizing only later that he had forgotten to change out of his old red Indiana University sweatshirt, and no one else noticed either. Mark is married with four children and eight grandchildren. He is an Orthodox Jew who sometimes leads services in his local synagogue and sings in the synagogue choir. With his Hoosier roots and his four decades of living in and reporting on the Middle East, Mark is especially qualified to help us understand the turbulent region, region and the sometimes questionable news coverage of events there. Please join me in welcoming Mark Levy home to Fort Wayne. Thanks, Steve. 
Uh, I'd like to talk to you tonight uh, about our perceptions of the Middle East, our society's perceptions of the Middle East, that lead to the media perceptions of the Middle East, and practically all of them are wrong. Practically all of them are wrong, for reasons I'll try to explain. There are the three large pyramids and a group of pyramids just outside Cairo. There's my favorite panel. And there's the title of my lecture. And I'll ask you, what's missing? Not the folks who were here before. <laughs> what's missing? Anybody? People. 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 Tourists. Yes, tourists. People. Yeah, exactly. Where are all the tourists? And what's the significance of this? Tourism to Egypt has been decimated by three, now four years of unrest and turmoil. Most people who want to go on vacation don't want to go to a place where everything's hitting the fan. And it's perfectly understandable. In my book, I write that I think it's pretty safe. I don't want to go out on a limb and, and guarantee anything. But uh, if you want to go see the pyramids, Now's the time, you'll have them all to yourself. <laughs> so, what you don't see here are tourists. And what you also don't see here is coverage of the fact that there are no tourists in Egypt now. And that's linked to what I consider to be the only story of any importance in Egypt. Not the Muslim Brotherhood. Not whether there was a coup or there wasn't a coup. It's the economy. Egypt's economy is in even worse condition than it was when I started going there in 2009. And when I started going there in 2009, the statistics were pretty much the same as they are today. 40% of Egypt's 82 million people, 30, ah, I don't know math very well, 37 million people, live below or at the international poverty line, which is $2 per day per person. You can do the math better than I can. That's living a living family of four on a couple hundred bucks a month. Now, how do you do that? You certainly don't do that if you have the health care system like we have. You certainly don't do that even if you pay $2 a gallon for gasoline. The way you do that is the government, facing the hardships of its people, tries to help out. And how does it do that? Through subsidies. It subsidizes fuel. It subsidizes basic food products. And so somehow people can buy the basic things they need to avoid starvation. There's a problem with this. <clears throat> Subsidies are extremely inefficient. They apply to everybody. If I'd had a car in Cairo, and I'm not that crazy, if I'd had a car in Cairo, I would go to the gas station and uh, fill up the tank for 75 cents a gallon, more or less. I lived in Cairo, and granted, uh, I have a reputation well deserved of being the world's greatest cheap hater. But I lived in Cairo for $1,000 a month, including my rent, which was about 600 of that. Now, I worked nights, so I couldn't do the nightlife thing, and I'm not the type. But we're talking food, we're talking uh, rent, mostly food and rent. We're talking the occasional restaurant and coffee, of course. I can't imagine not having coffee. And all that to, to live in a very nice little apartment uh, in, in a nice neighborhood of Cairo. Everything's relative, you understand. Nice neighborhood of Cairo isn't really what we think of as a nice neighborhood. It's more like Creighton Street, but whatever. Uh, thousand dollars a month. And I'm making a Western salary. So with subsidies, there's a 
whole lot of waste. Terribly inefficient. Subsidies distort society and the economy in ways that we can't even imagine. Farmers feed subsidized bread to their chicken because it's cheaper than chicken feed. <coughs> Cars are everywhere in Cairo. It's a city of 18 million people, and I swear there are 18 million cars. Uh, the air pollution there is a killer. Uh, for many years, I've carried one of these little bottles in my pocket. It's eye drops. I must have splashed these things in my eyes average of four times a day over there because the air is, you can see it. it it's something that, that you have to go to Beijing, I think, to get worse. And of course, Cairo set a record once for um, for pollutants of the solid kind, and that's not the sort of record you really want to set if you're going to try to attract tourists, let's say. So obviously, and this is just one example of subsidies. Obviously, if you want to change the economic situation in and bring it more toward the developed world, where people can invest and make money and make profits, and the people can get jobs that pay well and live good, nice, middle-class lives. You have to get rid of the subsidies. I did some research and found out if you get rid of the subsidies tomorrow, you have immediate 30% inflation. And most of that inflation has to do with fuel. Everything has a, a fuel content, right? Every, everything that is manufactured and shipped somewhere has a, a fuel element in its price. Not just the taxes. God help us, the taxes. Uh, I used to walk around Cairo all the time. It was very fun. Uh, I would walk, and, and, and that street looks interesting. I go down that street. And that look, I go down that street. I have no sense of direction. This morning, I took the wrong turn on Main Street. <laughs> I grew up here. I used to do it all the time then, too. And, you know, at one point, I'd look at my watch and, and see that it's time for me uh, to get ready for work. So I get to a larger street and wait no more than two minutes and stop a taxi because there are that many of them. It's New York on steroids. <laughs> Jump in the taxi, tell him my address, he brought me uh, back to my apartment in 10, 15 minutes, whatever it was, I pay him a dollar, subsidized gas, that's all it takes. I pay him a dollar and then I'm, I'm back. To eliminate the system of subsidies in Egypt would cause tremendous upheavals. There would be people starving. <coughs> Because there has to be this transition period between getting rid of the subsidies and getting the economy screwed back together. And in that transition, I'm not exaggerating, people would starve. There might be riots. There would probably be riots. So what kind of government do you suppose to do such a thing? Egypt is a place where they had two revolutions and pitched out two governments in the space of two years. Uh, the dictatorial government, Hosni Mubarak, the longtime president, and the Muslim Brotherhood government, elected fairly, democratically, if you will. We'll get to that in a minute. But they pitched out the democratically elected government. So, what kind of government would have the strength to undertake the reforms that must be undertaken, and everybody understands they must be undertaken? A dictatorship, what they call a benevolent dictator, backed by the military. And that's what they've got. That's what they have. Every dictator in history that I'm aware of is good for a while and then gets corrupt and then needs to be, how shall we say, uh, replaced. 
so far, uh, Abdul Fattah al-Sisi is doing all the right things. He has cut subsidies on fuel. He's cut subsidies on certain strains of cotton that can no longer be exported and sold in the world. And the upheavals so far have been limited because the people like the guy. They elected some other guy that they like this fellow because he's playing the right tune. And he's doing the right thing. I've just told you a lot of stuff I'll bet you've never read anywhere. Am I right? And yet, you read about Egypt from time to time. You hear about the Muslim Brotherhood. You hear about uh, people being imprisoned. You hear about riots. You hear about uh, demonstrations. Why don't you hear about this? Why don't you hear about my friend Alfred there, all alone in front of those pyramids? I'll tell you why. Economics is boring. It's hard to write a story about economics that's interesting. So most people don't even bother. They, oh, I don't understand economics. Like reporters, I don't understand economics. Uh, I can't write about that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here to tell you that when I entered journalism in the early 60s, I'm that old, I covered sport uh, high school basketball teams for the Journal Gazette uh, in starting in 1963, and I was 16. I, I, I don't know how to do anything else. Someone says, taught a second degree, right? I don't know how to do anything else. When I started doing this seriously, I drew up an axiom of journalism, and that is that everything that happens in the world has two elements, in significance and interest. And in order to qualify as a bona fide news story, not talking about human interest features, as a bona fide news story, an event has to have both significance and interest. Now what happens if there's a story that has significance but not interest? Then, it is my job as a journalist to find a way to make it interesting so that you will enjoy reading it and learn something from it or watch it and say, oh wow, or listen to it on the radio and say, I didn't know that, that's, that's cool. That's my job as a journalist. I can't say, I don't think about economics, let someone else do it, or who cares, I'd rather cover politics. That's just not the job. Covering that, that's the job. There are many other examples of stories that weren't done, and haven't been done, that you don't know about. And the worst or best or most disgusting example of all is this one. In 2008, Israel offered that to the Palestinians in exchange for peace. What you're seeing there in yellow <coughs> It is most of the West Bank and all of the Gaza Strip. In white, there are little places that just, I'm sorry, I think it's blue. I'm really, really awful with colors. Uh, the blue pieces there are pieces that Israel would annex of the West Bank, settlements that are close to, to, to the line that separates the West Bank with Israel. Uh, and the red things you see up on, at the bottom of the West Bank, right, in next to Gaza. Those are pieces, of, and a couple of other places, those are pieces of Israeli territory that Israel would trade to make up the difference for the bits that in blue that it annexes. And the most important thing of all, you see down toward the bottom of the West Bank, there's a little black box, uh, the name I can't read in the middle, doesn't matter, and there's a line that goes across and some writing in there that's probably too faint for you to see. I'm going to go point to it here. I'm talking about this. That is a pathway for the Palestinians to use to get between the West Bank and Gaza, something that has never existed before. Gaza and the West Bank are separate territories. And this is a vital part of any Palestinian state, yet it never existed before. It's not part of the West Bank. It's not part of Gaza. And this was part of Israel's offer. Now, I found out that this happened 
that this offer had been made. And the Associated Press, for whom I worked at the time, did not let me write about it. I'll explain why soon. But the fact of the matter is there's a story you missed. There are some others. I'll explain those as well. This is a city in Israel known as Netanya. It's between Tel Aviv and Haifa on the Mediterranean coast. Look at those beautiful beaches. Tourists love Netanya. It's not a drawback. Netanya is about nine miles from the West Bank. And for, for 1967, for about 35 years, there was no line except in, in, on a map that divided Israel from the West Bank. It was hard, the, the line was hardly guarded at all. You could walk back and forth across it. And in the time that I knew in 1987, I had my honeymoon there. I've changed a bit. <laughs> That Natanya ceased to exist for a while because a Palestinian strapped explosives around his midsection, walked across the line from the West Bank into Israel, maybe hitched a ride, maybe walked the nine miles, and walked into the Park Hotel in April 2001 on the first evening of the Passover holiday when Jews get together for a meal they call the Seder. It's a ritual recitation of the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. The park was held as a host of such a Seder. There were a couple of hundred people there. This guy walked into the park hotel, detonated explosives, and killed 30 people. One of the worst terror attacks Israel's ever suffered. God knows I've covered a lot. I covered covered a uh, bus bombing uh, with my microphone and my tape recorder on the scene at the time when I wasn't sure whether my daughter was on that bus or not. I'll try doing that sometime. She was on the bus in front. Thank God. The next week, a uh, uh, another bus went up. That was my son's bus. He was in the army at the time. Uh, but he had done some minor infraction and been confined to the base for that weekend. It saved his life and mine. So how do you stop terror attacks like this? First of all, do you have the right to stop terror attacks like this? I think it's kind of obvious you do. Short of, uh, of draconian measures and massacres and all kinds of, of collective punishment that do more harm than good, I think it's fairly obvious that a nation has the right to try to stop terror attacks like this. And Israel did this. He built that wall. I'm sure you've all heard about. It's the uh, separation barrier between the West Bank and Israel. For the most part, it goes along the 1949 ceasefire line that delineates the West Bank, we did in the map we saw earlier, it juts in a couple of places into the West Bank to put some of those settlements on the Israeli side of the wall. And for months and years, we wrote story after story about how this wall had caused hardships to the Palestinians. And I don't dispute for a moment that it caused hardships to Palestinians. Uh, it did not cause hardships to 600,000 Palestinians, as the United Nations said, and then it had to retract that stupid figure. That would be one out of three Palestinians in the West Bank time. Uh, but there were farmers who were cut off from their land. This is true. Uh, Palestinians could no longer just walk across the line and get an illegal job in Israel, and I'm not disparaging this. Working in Israel was, until the violence erupted, a main source of income for Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, and the violence and the reaction to it pretty much put a stop to that. 
hardship, no question about it. But is that the whole story? I suggested that we go back to Natanya and do a story called The Other Side of the Wall. Because within a year or two after that wall was built, Natanya resurrected itself, became <laughs> what it was before. It became a tourist center, a, a, a haven for, for tourists, <coughs> foreign tourists, Israeli tourists, you name it. The place was filled and it was hot. It was great. And so I, just, I, I said, let's do a story. The other side of the wall. Now nah, that's not news. Now nah, that, 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 you know, that's not news. That was the answer I got from my boss. Starting to get a message here that there are stories that we do and stories we don't. I think what we've got going on here, and I'm not doing a value judgment, I'm doing an analysis. I'm not trying to be criticizing or critical or preachy or any of that. I'm trying to figure out what in the hell is going on here. Why is this happening? I think I'm on to something. Let's say you turned on the ESPN. Some of you do. Let's say you turn on the ESPN and there's a football game on. And the score is 21-7. It's not the Colts. It's not the Hoosiers. It's not the Boilermakers. It's two teams you never heard of that you don't follow. And it's 21-7. to Whom would you normally root for? The underdog. The underdog. The underdog, right? Am I right? Yeah. You'd naturally root for the underdog to see if he can score those two touchdowns, maybe a two-point conversion, tie or win the game from this team that is obviously stronger than they are. What you might not know, since you don't know these teams, that the one with the seven points might have gotten five scholarships canceled because of all kinds of recruiting violations, and the 21 might be the team that has followed all the rules religiously for the last 50 years and has never won a football game before. Those two things might be connected. You don't know that, but you do know you're rooting for the underdog. And I think that's what's happened here. I started discerning this around 2001, I'll get to the reason for it later, that no matter what Israel does, it's the strong guy. And no matter what the Palestinians do, they're the underdog. And you're rooting for the underdog. And does that explain why a story that doesn't fit the narrative of the Palestinian president turning down a peace proposal like that, it doesn't fit into that uh, round hole, square peg, whatever. And a story about how uh, a barrier like that has resurrected an Israeli city that was decimated by a, a terror attack a world-class responsibility. I think it does. And now what I want to make sure you understand is that I don't say here that the journalists who are following this mindset are anti-Semites, or anti-Israel, or nasty people, or lousy journalists. They're, the journalists in Israel and, and, and territories are among the best in the world. It's a fun position. Everybody wants to go work in Israel, get a lot of press, get on the front page all the time, and, you know, you're also scrutinized very, very closely. Uh, back in the days when I was working for CBC Radio, uh, first of all, people didn't even know I was Jewish. It's radio. Uh, and I always said that if the piles, they said too, if the piles of complaints pouring in about my work are about the same height, I'm good. <laughs> so there's a lot of scrutiny there. That said, Journalists come, of course, from societies. And they share the mores and beliefs and traditions of the societies from which they come. It's almost impossible to imagine or to demand of a journalist to 
throw all that aside at the door. And so if the society has decided that the underdog is the one to root for, chances are the journalists will also. Well, let me show you where this goes. This refers to an attack where two Palestinians with knives broke into a synagogue in Jerusalem, this is recently, and killed four rabbis and a border policeman. I believe three of the rabbis had American citizenship as well as Israeli, and the fourth had British. Doesn't matter. Uh, they, they killed four Jews who were praying. And here we have a CNN tweet. And I can guarantee you that the military spokesman's announcement that is being quoted here did not put terror attacks in quotes. Now, there are two ways to read this. Either terror attack is a quote from the statement, or more likely it is to be perceived by most people as terror attack. It's a mistake. Here's another one. Same incident points out the fact that the Palestinian attackers were killed. So now we have four Israelis and two Palestinians killed in a synagogue attack. Well, who was the attacker? The Martians? <laughs> you see, what you're getting from this headline is that there's been a very unfortunate accident of some sort. Not an accident, it says attack, but some sort of attack by somebody and then it killed four, four Israelis and two Palestinians. It's factual as far as it goes, but it's wrong. And it's a mistake. We're not done yet. <clears throat> this is the best one. <laughs> yeah, uh, he's standing in front of the synagogue for him to say, and he's writing it there. And yet it says Jerusalem Mosque. I think you see what's going on here. We are burdened by the fact that covering breaking news requires us to act instantly. We no longer have the opportunity to wait until tomorrow morning's newspaper to get the whole story right and then put it in the paper tomorrow morning. Those days are long gone. Now, everyone's competing to get the story out there first. And that way you own the story. And if someone else gets it out there first, they own the story, and you get nasty calls from your bosses in New York. <coughs> so you move fast, too fast, much too fast, and you make mistakes like that. There's a pattern here, and another instance I think will show you what that pattern is, if you haven't picked it up already, because I don't exactly hide it, do I? A uh, driver rammed his car into a Jerusalem light rail station where several dozen Israelis were waiting for the light rail train to come by, rammed his car into the crowd, killed a baby, and later a young woman died of her wounds. Okay. Breaking news story. The first thing you hear is somebody rammed the car into a crowd of Israelis. So what did my former friend at the Associated Press do with this? On the right. That's also accurate because a policeman shot and killed the driver. And that's the story. Really? It says in the story that the police suspected it was an intentional attack. So we knew that. Police also say that nine people were wounded, some seriously. They didn't know about the baby at that point. Fine. They knew that as well. And that's the headline? Really? Well, uh, I was, how shall we say, somewhat mildly displeased with the treatment of that story. Um, from time to time, I'm sure you've heard a, a, a noise you can't identify as mainstream, all the way from over there. 
Uh, and I, how shall we say, objected not mildly at all to this travesty of journalism in every forum I could find, and everyone who would listen. Uh, and the bureau chief of the Associated Press, who until that day had been a friend of mine, came down on me like a ton of bricks. How could you have done this? How could you have joined this chorus of anti uh, AP or anti whatever criticism without calling me and asking me what happened? Well, first of all, you don't have the opportunity to call him and ask him what happened. And I already know what happened. I know on two levels. First of all, here's what he said happened. That headline was written for the brief. That's the uh, paragraph you saw before, the, the little story. <coughs> the brief went all we knew was that there had been a car accident and a guy had been shot. We didn't know if it was intentional. Yes, they did. That a baby had been killed or whether the driver was an Arab. New information came in and, read together with me, I forgot to update the headline. I didn't bother answering that because I'm more interested here, interested here in what the pattern is. I know, and every journalist knows, that there have been many instances over the last decade in which someone has rammed a car into a crowd of Israelis. And each and every time, every time, it was an intentional attack by Palestinians trying to kill Israelis, every time. So why would you assume, why would you assume that it might have been an accident? <coughs> it's empirical, I grant, but experience shows that the more logical assumption is to write a headline that says, car, ramp, train station, comma, apparent attack. I've been writing headlines for decades. It's the same length as the one they screwed up with here. You're covered, if you need to cover something, you're covered by saying apparent. Therefore, it turns out to be the only time in the last decade that one of these instances has been a traffic accident, you're covered, looked like an attack, it wasn't, oops, fine. What's the pattern here? It's what I said before. It's the pattern of the underdog and the power of doing something to the underdog. You just assume that Israel shot a guy, and that's the story. You just assume that because you've taken sides. There are other issues that happen when you take sides. <laughs> You start changing your language. What you see in front of you here is a Jerusalem neighborhood, a Jewish neighborhood in East Jerusalem. That's the part Israel captured in 1967 and annexed. No one in the world recognizes that annexation. Nevertheless, Israel built neighborhoods there for its people. And there's one of them. It's a neighborhood that's been there for 40 years. It has 60,000 people in it. At one point, because it's disputed territory and the Palestinians claim East Jerusalem as their capital, we came under pressure, internal and external, to start calling that a settlement. I objected, not because of what you think. I objected on communication grounds, not political grounds. When I hear the word settlement, I picture four trailers on a hilltop somewhere. That's a neighborhood of 60,000 people. That's not a settlement. Maybe technically or legally you might make a case for me that it is, but I'm not in the technical and legal business. I'm in the communication business. I'd be more than happy to call that a Jerusalem, a neighborhood on land claimed by the Palestinians. I'd be more than happy to say that uh, the world considers, considers that neighborhood illegal. But I'm not prepared to call it a settlement because it gives the wrong picture. 
Dance up. Red room. Well, I lost that. I lose a lot. And I'm pretty good. Let's take a let's take another reason why we keep getting things wrong when we report it. This is a whole different subject. This is about the Gaza war of last year, just as an example. These are, this is a, a picture, one of many that you would have seen from Gaza uh, after or during the conflict when Hamas in Gaza was firing 4,000 rockets at Israel and Israel was launching 4,000 airstrikes uh, at Gaza ostensibly aimed at rocket launching sites uh, and, and militant hangouts and whatever. And you saw a lot of these pictures. This one is an apartment building that was knocked down in an Israeli airstrike. And very likely people got killed there, how could they not? Uh, and likely they were civilians, how could they not be? Uh, and this happened all over, the, all over the territory. The Israelis kept saying that Hamas was setting up its rocket launching sites uh, near buildings like this, and schools and cemeteries, and you name it. This is the reason why Israel was firing, was, was carrying out those airstrikes. There are three rockets, you can see the, the Mediterranean Sea there behind that neighborhood. Those are three rockets heading north toward Israel. That's a neighborhood in Gaza City called Shejedia. It goes right up to the fence uh, that, that separates Gaza from Israel. And those pictures, pictures like this, this one in particular, and all the other ones, all the other ones of rocket fire, were taken from Israel. Set your camera up on the little hill just across the fence. Roll your film, video, whatever you roll these days. Oh, I just dated myself. And he did this. Now the question becomes then, if Hamas fired 4,000 rockets during a period of six weeks, how come you never saw any of them from there? Well, a Spanish photographer screwed up his courage and told us anyone who would listen, that while he was in Gaza, he spoke after he left, of course, while he was in Gaza, he was in his hotel room, he looked out and saw Hamas setting up a rocket launching thing outside the hotel. His camera was ready, and he knew if he clicked the shutter, they would have killed him. Hamas set up a rocket launcher and fired rockets next to the building where several major Western news agencies had their headquarters in Gaza. Did you see pictures of that? You're damn right you didn't. Because just afterwards, Hamas sent a bunch of armed thugs into the offices of one of those news agencies, rampaged through the place, made sure everyone understood that they're not coming around here. You broadcast something we don't like, and it's not like we're going to ground you or cut off your allowance. It's going to be a lot more serious than that. It's been documented that the reason you didn't see Hamas fighters being taken to Shifa Hospital, the hospital on the seacoast in Gaza City. It's a great homeless place right across the street, by the way. Uh, the reason you didn't see the Hamas casualties is that the line of cameras in front of the hospital, filming, videoing, whatever they do these days, uh, the scene of, of casualties being brought to the hospital, when they were bringing Hamas casualties in, the signal went up and everybody turned off the cameras. Or else. I can tell you a long story of a fellow who uh, tried real hard to be a proper journalist 
as a Palestinian living in Gaza and worked for a foreign news agency and made the mistake of getting married and having kids. That's when everything went south. He would call us and plead with us to take his name off the story, to change the date line from Gaza City to Jerusalem because they were threatening his kids. This guy finally gave up and left Gaza a few months ago uh, in a state of health that I hope I'm not in for another 20 years, and he's 35. His story is typical. It's atypical only if he tried so hard, tried so hard to do the job right. Whereas most Palestinian journalists understand that uh, nothing's as important as their wives and kids, and they don't try that hard. Now, if you think I'm saying that this is a problem specific to the West Bank and Gaza, then I'm getting the wrong message across. It's across the region. In Iran, for example, the Associated Press had a couple of local reporters to basically rewrite the government news agency's press releases, and that's about all they could do. But as soon as I asked them to do something else, they said, hey, I can't do that. And I understood why. They also have their phones attacked, of course. And everything I say to them, the bad guys might be listening. themselves, if you will, 
will get in exactly the same amount of trouble that they would have if they reported the whole story. If I put a paragraph in my story from Iran saying there's more to the story that we can't tell you because our reporters are, are banned, you know, they'll end up in jail. So what's the answer? I wish I had one. The answer, I guess, is to read everything and note where the date line is and to understand if it's in a developing country or an Arab country, you may not be getting the whole story. If it's coming out of Israel, you probably are. I'm not saying it's right, wrong, or indifferent, but you're not subjected to that kind of intimidation. <clears throat> so let's go back to this for a moment. Not certainly makes sense. Mahmoud Abbas turns on his heel, walks out the door and slams it, refuses to sign that map, and never meets the Israeli Prime Minister again. Here I discover this by reading translations of interviews in Al Jazeera and other places. And I come across this interview with Saad Erika, my old buddy. He's the chief Palestinian negotiator. Uh, he's a night owl like me. I was the night editor responsible for the operation of the Associated Press Bureau from 4 p.m. until the next morning. And time, time to time, there would be a development in the United States, for example, which is seven hours behind the head, whatever, behind, right? Behind, so it's real late over there if something happened at, uh, at 6 p.m. in America, well, it's already 1 a.m. in Israel, and we need reaction, we need it now. Well, science always up. You know, like me, I mean, he's up one or two o'clock in the morning, and I can just pick up my phone, call Syed, and get a comment, put it on the wire, and everyone's happy. He and I both get very unhappy if you call us before 11 in the morning. That's the other side of the story. Okay? So I saw this interview with Syed. Uh, yeah, we're on a first name basis. We've been for years. Uh, I like the guy. I know he's a, he has a job to do and he does it very well. I'm not sure he believes everything he says. By now, probably he does. Anyway, he's a very smart fellow, doctorate in political science. That's two more, two more degrees than I've got. Uh, so, I saw this this interview. And here's a piece, uh, here's a quote from my book. I don't usually put on quotes in my book, but there it is. And, and there's his explanation. And there's the confirmation, that's a journalistic term, when, when someone says something that confirms what you know, and he does it on the record with his name intact. There's confirmation that Israel offered a proposal that talked about Jerusalem is almost 100% of the West Bank. There it is. I went and found out found that map. That's not the actual map. That's a, a, a close. It's, it's, it's an artistic representation and very accurate of what Israel offered. And he's saying here that, uh, that uh, President Abbas said he couldn't compromise over Jerusalem and he couldn't compromise over the borders. In my view, that's not the reason. Uh, it doesn't matter. The fact of the matter is, here is confirmation of two things. Here is confirmation that Israel made that offer and that Abbas turned it down. How is that not news? How is that not news? Whatever your scenario, whatever your underdog, overdog, whatever your dog. Uh, let me put it as succinctly as possible. Had this become public in 2009 when I discovered it, March 2009, it might have changed the equation a bit. Because up until then, and to, and, and to today, including today, the general Western concept, if I exaggerate only slightly, is that there is one party to the Israel-Palestinian conflict, and everything depends on what that party, Israel, does or doesn't do. The Palestinians have no role in this. They are the ones who are the victims, and they are the ones who are supposed to receive from Israel whatever concessions Israel makes. But they didn't. 
Israel offered them a state. And he says here, almost 100% of the West Bank, Israel even made up the difference. And they turned it down. Had this been known in real time, who knows? Maybe it would have changed something. I can say without any reservation that the spiking of this story, the banning of, of, of the publication of Israel's 2008 peace offer, when I found it out, and I was banned from writing about it, is the worst journalistic fiasco I have ever been unfortunate enough to be associated with. Without any doubt, and we're talking going back to a career that started with the Fort Wayne Journal Gazette in 1963. I started feeling the shift uh, in 2001. Other people dated to uh, the, the start of the first Palestinian uprising when. Kids were, were throwing rocks at Israeli soldiers, and they were being uh, interviewed and, and lauded and lionized for their bravery to confront Israeli soldiers with their heavy artillery and arms and machine guns and whatever. Uh, I dated in 2001 when a map similar to the one you saw, I think last year, uh, was offered to the Palestinians at Camp David. 2000, in July 2000, when President Clinton brought Yasser Arafat and the Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak in for a summit meeting to try to settle this thing once and for all. And an uh, offer similar to this one came out of that, and Arafat also turned on his heel, walked out the door, and signed it, and violence erupted and like that. But before it did, uh, President Clinton, in the last days of his administration, put out a peace plan of his own, based on this, something like that. Uh, I've got the old map hanging in my office. I've had it there for years. Uh, Israel accepted it, and the Palestinians rejected it. And yet nothing changed. Israel was still the bad guy, and still had to make concessions, and the Palestinians were still the victims, and had to be, uh, had to be accommodated. And that's when I thought, whoa, what's going on here? That's not the journalism I signed up for. I'm not supposed to be taking sides. I covered lots of stories that really made Israel look awful. It's my job. I also, made, I also did stories that made Palestinians look terrific. That's also my job. I did a story during the, uh, the first uprising of Palestinian revolutionary music for CBC. <coughs> I had to sit on my hands because the keyboard guy was having trouble getting the rhythm right. <laughs> I wanted to jump up and do it for him. I'm not allowed to. It's supposed to be watching. Uh, it's my job to tell the story and put it into context and express it in a way that interests you. That's my job. When the coin fell into the old-fashioned telephone in my head, about what the problem is. Well, just a few weeks ago, when I was being interviewed by the BBC radio, radio, of course, uh, you know, I'm a radio guy, and I'm told I have a face for radio. <laughs> uh, I was being interviewed by the BBC uh, on a media program about some of the issues we're talking about today, and the program presenter, herself a journalist, asked me that. Isn't it your job to speak truth to power? And he clearly thought that there was a clear answer to that, and of course that's my job. No! No, that's not my job. I already told you what my job is. And if you do this, you're doing it wrong. If it's your job to speak truth to power, then the power side is automatically wrong, and the other side is automatically truth. And you've chosen sides absolutely for both. Now, if you recognize that quote, I'm sure we've all heard it. 
the earliest reference to that quote that I found was Mayor Dresden. Without Mayor Dresden, there would have been no Martin Luther King. He was a pioneer civil rights leader. And he said that in 1942, describing his own job, speaking truth to power. Well, sure, he's an activist. That is his job. And it's my job to report that Mayor Dresden said today it's our job to speak truth to power. And here's what that means. <coughs> It's not my job, it's his job. And if I start doing that, I start screwing up big time. Yet, I think in today's atmosphere of gotcha journalism, scandal monitoring, and the speed with which you have to get on the wire, or on the tweet, or on the Facebook, or on the whatever, this is what's happening. It's a lot easier than to actually sit down and figure things out. This distorts coverage all over the region. <clears throat> We've already talked about Egypt's revolutions. And I made the point that this one, which was uh, fishing out Mohammed Morsi, the Muslim Brotherhood president who was elected, uh, but was then pitched out by, uh, by a popular revolution. We covered that as the people pitching out a properly elected Muslim Brotherhood president because he was from the Muslim Brotherhood. Normally he covered it that way, and the people don't like the Muslim Brotherhood. Well, wrong. First of all, the people are just fine with the Muslim Brotherhood. Uh, in my experience, Egyptians are Muslims and they're very comfortable with it. Uh, that's their way of life. They don't try to export their religion. They don't try to force it on their neighbors. They practice it quietly in their own homes. If they happen to be outside at prayer time, they might unroll a rug and face Mecca and pray. No one pays attention. Uh, no one says anything, and, and no one does anything. They're very, very easy with this. The Muslim Brotherhood itself in Egypt is not coercive. This could go on a long time. I can speak for a long time about this. The point is, this revolution happened not because Mohammed Morsi is from the Muslim Brotherhood. This revolution happened because Mohammed Morsi was an awful president. He was terrible. He would try to declare a policy and find out that it was completely, totally wrong, and two weeks later rescind the policy and try something else. And in the meantime, he'd go on television pounding his fist on the table and screaming, and people said, what is that? Who needs this? And that was the result. <clears throat> and then, of course, the result was uh, a coup. And we, over here in America, uh, tried to, to bat the ball back and forth a few times. Is this a coup if it's not, or it's a coup? Or it's... Because we have this legislation that requires us, if it was a coup, to cut off aid. Well, that's a fine mess. I already told you that uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, the guy who did the coup, supposedly, is exactly what Egyptians need right now, and they know it, and they like it. And here we get involved with our own little definition. Bad mistake. The administration did whatever it could to minimize the damage, but there it is. We have no choice legally but to penalize the government of a friendly country, and basically force it to find aid elsewhere. Well, there's Qatar over there, not a problem, lots of money there. Uh, there's Saudi Arabia, there's Russia. <clears throat> we don't help them, they will. <clears throat> what have we gained from that? Well, damn it. I'd like to extend this one step further to our friends from, from ISIS. <clears throat> And I'd like to observe that if I were that fellow with the yellow flag, I would go up to the commander of ISIS and say, here's the deal. If we really want to galvanize support of our people around our little organization here, here's all we have to do. We have to set up a camera, we have to find some poor American, and behead him on camera. And a week later, another one. 
That will anger the Americans. And the Americans, because they always react this way, will send in the planes and start bombing, and send in the troops to advise. And then our people will unite against the American imperialists again. And we'll be strong. And guess what, friends? That's pretty much what's happened. They set a trap, fell into it, and they're laughing at us. Mind you, and I'm aware of, well aware of the fact that it's unconventional. My view is that the war against ISIS is not America's war. Not America's war. They will very likely take over parts large parts of Iraq and Syria. They do not threaten America militarily. They threaten America and Europe as terrorists. While we've been controlling Al-Qaeda for the last decade and a half, through intelligence, both kinds, the military intelligence you gather in the field and the type between your ears, and that's the way to deal with ISIS, or ISIL, or IS, or whatever these people are. And you can be pretty sure that if they do end up taking over large swaths of territory in Iraq and Syria, maybe Jordan, uh, maybe parts of whatever, that in a very short order, months, maybe years, probably months, in a very short order, They'll break up into squabbling little groups of, of, of crazy militants who are fighting each other again. And they won't be paying attention to us at all. So, if we want to do this sensibly, we need to protect our own interests. And our own interests are infiltrating them and knowing what they're going to do before they do it. The same way as doing Al-Qaeda for more than a decade. Now, if you'll indulge me just for a few minutes, I'd like to tell you a little bit about another story that isn't covered much, and I will admit that it's not on the scale of importance as the other ones. It's got less significance, but a lot of it. These two women are among the last Jews of Cairo. I took this picture at the funeral of the Long-time leader of the Cairo Jewish community was taken in the only synagogue that is still active in any way in Cairo. Uh, I went there on a Sabbath morning once to pray there, and I was the only Jew. Uh, it's pretty tragic because, after all, even if you don't count the part of the Bible. Uh, Jews escaped from the Holy Land to Egypt in the 6th century BC uh, when Alexander the Great founded Alexandria in the 3rd century, 4th century BC. He had Jewish soldiers with him. At one point, there were 60,000 Jews in, in Egypt. It all started going south in the 1940s. Uh, when Egypt, Egyptians, for political reasons, not anti-Semitic reasons, sided with Germany in World War II. Well, it was an anti-British thing. Uh, uh, Britain controlled Egypt at the time. They wanted to fix the British out. Who wouldn't? So they sided with, uh, with the Axis. And as an indirect result, attacks against Jews increased and about 40% of Egypt Jews left by the end of the 40s. And of course, by the end of the 40s, you had the creation of the State of Israel, which caused more tension. And the last straw was 1956, when Britain and France objected to the fact that Gamal Abdel Nasser, the legendary and nationalistic leader of Egypt who helped overthrow the monarchy, nationalized the Suez Canal. 
Britain and France wanted it back, and they pretty much forced Israel to take part in the campaign, which failed. Uh, but that gave Nasser the, all the impetus he needed to expel all the foreigners from Egypt and all the Jews. Two categories there, because the Jews are Egyptians. Might have left a thousand or two thousand Jews there. Uh, not a critical mass, and they're disappearing. So I've talked about Cairo a lot tonight. I spent most of my time there, granted. Uh, it's a vibrant, dirty, poor city of 18 million. The infrastructure is, is, is creeping, if at all. Uh, there's a lot of poverty and a lot, awful lot of nice people. I walked around Cairo at will, going places that tourists don't go to, the not a tourist. And people were so thrilled to see a foreigner. Uh, American, that's what I mean. Uh, and we're so patient with my Arabic, and, and uh, I learned a lot and saw a lot. And I have to emphasize now that I saw a lot and walked around a lot, and people treated me nicely because I'm a guy. This is another problem that I really, really wish I'd see more reporting about because it affects half the population of the Arab world, the oppression of women. Every single woman I knew in Cairo, every single one, would tell you, could tell you story after story of sexual harassment, abuse, catcalls, whistles, groping, and much, much worse. Much worse. And yet, I see an occasional story about this, but it seems to me that that story is a whole lot more important than the Muslim Brotherhood. And yet, and yet, where's the cover? Well, we're fixated on politics, we journalists, much too much. Don't even do economics, much less social issues. But it's a great, it's a big miss, a big, big miss, because that's a huge, huge, story, and there are two chapters in my book about it. That's how important I think it is. So that's Cairo. Uh, it's got the pyramids, of course. It's got the Nile. <clears throat> wow. But it's not a beautiful city. Alexandria, on the other hand, is along the Mediterranean coast. And it's drop-dead gorgeous. I took that picture from the, the seashore where uh, Alexandria stretches along miles and miles of seashore. I took that across the cove that guards Alexandria, and that's the, the brand new fort that guards. That goes back only to about 1400. <laughs> that's kind of new over there. Uh, and when I went to visit Alexandria, naturally the first time. Uh, the first place I went was to go to see the big synagogue, because there is a fabulous synagogue there. It's called Eliyahu Nabi, um, Elijah the Prophet Synagogue. There it is. I really wanted to see it. Uh, so I rattled the fence, and one of the Egyptian guards came over and said, what are you doing here? I said, I'd like to see the synagogue. Said, well, OK, go around to the side, and we'll let you in. So I went around to the side, uh, and there was another guard uh, who looked me over, took my passport, and said, up there and up the stairs and have a ball. So I walked into the synagogue, which is a huge place. It, it has something about a thousand chairs set up. There are by now something on the order of seven Jews left in Alexandria. Uh, so I'm standing at the front of the synagogue, uh, looking at the, at the ornate trappings of the place. And I heard the door open behind me, paying attention. A minute later, a man pipes up from behind me and says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi. Oh my God. I thought to myself as my blood froze, 
I've been coming in and out of here for four years. I've lived in Cairo for two years. I'm about to go home, and now they're coming after me? Well, I turned around and saw this nice little guy. His name is uh, Abed al Nabi. He's Jewish, he runs the synagogue. <laughs> and he pulled a trick on me. Apparently, he pulls this trick on everybody. There aren't that many people. Anybody who comes to see the synagogue, he pulls this little trick. He didn't know I'm an Israeli, and this would like take 10 years off my life. <coughs> my, you know, how do you know my name? Did anyone pick up on it? Yes. My passport. Yes. It was my American passport, of course. My Israeli passport, my Israeli cell phone, and anything else Israeli was in a hiding place in my apartment. That nobody could have found even if they looked for it. So my American passport, and this fellow, of course, had no way of knowing that this, this was going to kind of mildly freak me out. <laughs> anyway, after we got over that little problem, uh, we had a very interesting talk about Alexandria and its Jews, and the synagogue and a mixture of Arabic, uh, French, and Hebrew. And all of which he spoke and I spoke to some extent or another, and we made ourselves understood. And at one point, he swept his arm across his great synagogue and said, this is the largest synagogue in the Middle East. To which I said, all right, fine, except for Israel. To which he said, Oh, no, he said. Israel isn't in the Middle East. Israel is in Europe. <laughs> and from my two years in Cairo, and what I learned there about the differences between the two, he's absolutely right. I'll be glad to answer any questions you have. It's been a great pleasure.
the U.S. Senate apparently inviting Netanyahu to speak without the knowledge of the White House. Okay, the question is, what's my take of, uh, of the uh, Speaker of the House inviting Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, to speak before a joint session of Congress without informing the White House? And do I want to go there? Does anyone else have a <laughs> um, I'll, I'll say this, I will not comment on internal American politics, not because I'm afraid, uh, but because I don't live here. You know, uh, what I'll say is this, as far as Netanyahu is concerned, it's an opportunity for him to present his case and his take on Iran and the dangers Iran uh, uh, faces Israel with. Uh, and it, it's a bully pulpit for him, you know, to, to get up in front of the Congress and, by the way of doing that, get into American media and make his case for whatever he believes needs to be done uh, uh, against Iran. And he doesn't really much care about the protocol. And he assumes, I imagine, I haven't talked to him about this, of course, but I, I imagine he assumes that no one over here will either, except with the belt, inside the Beltway in Washington, that the protocol thing will be forgotten and, uh, and no one will care about that. So that's from the Israeli point of view. As I said, I really would rather not go into the American. Yes? Do you think it hurts that it's just before the Israeli election? I don't think it's relevant to the Israeli election. No, you don't? Okay. No, I, I don't think it will make any difference. I wanted to get into the, uh, the Palestinian uh, the peace offer that uh, I enjoyed your talk at noon, and I, so I went home and did a little uh, browsing on the internet. I came across an article about 18 months ago, published by uh, Sofa forgot my, published by the Jerusalem Post group. Um, and they, they say that uh, uh, there were constant meetings between the Israelis and the Palestinians um, after that map was handed to them. Um, and they said, uh, we presented a map to Ulmer that would transfer 1.9% of the West Bank territory to Israeli pop sovereignty. On December 18th, we deposited our map and Ulmer's map, as we remembered it, with President Bush at the White House in the presence of Secretary Rice and National Security Advisor Hadley. Bush asked that we and Israel sent representatives on January 3rd, 2009. You're nodding, so you know about this, I guess. I've read the article, yes. But uh, then the Operation Cast Lead began. Mm -hmm. uh, if you would like to comment on that? Yes. Uh, in principle, I'm not aware that this actually happened. I am aware that when Abbas went back to Ramallah after slamming the door on Omer, he took out a piece of paper and sketched the map that he'd been offered. Uh, even though he was unable to accept it at the time. And I am aware that he at one point had said uh, that Israel is taking too much territory in, in that map, I have up on the screen, sorry, and, uh, and he would prefer that they take 1.9%. I am not aware that he drew a map. I don't think he did. And I'm also aware of the fact that the violence that erupted in Gaza was the reason why negotiations came to a halt. Now, from my point of view, uh, and now this is not as a journalist, this is from my point of view, if I'm a Palestinian leader, and my stated goal in life is to create a state for my people, and I'm offered a state that fulfills all of the requirements that I have stated in the past, 22%. Eric Hutt used to say this to me time and time. All we want is 22% of historical Palestine. There it is. Okay, you don't get everything you want? Who does? If it is my goal to create a state for my people, and I'm offered one, I sign on the map and say, thank you very much, now let's talk about the details. And all the rest of things that happen afterwards pale into total insignificance. And it happened twice. It happened in 2000, it happened in 2008. Do you want to know why I think it happened? Do you have a minute? I think it's the refugee problem. 
Palestinians have been promising their refugees uh, for six decades, sorry John, you've heard this already, <laughs> Uh, have been promising their, their, their refugees from the 1948-49 war that they will be allowed to return to their homes in Israel. Now, six or seven hundred thousand people, Palestinians, were either pitched out or fled voluntarily during that war and fully expected to go home. Uh, the Palestinians claimed the right of return based on the UN General Assembly resolution, it's not binding, but whatever. The thing is, six decades have passed, and it's not going to happen. Yet the Palestinians have kept their refugees and their descendants and their descendants, descendants in refugee camps all these years, promising them that they're going to go home. And no one has got the political clout. If Arafat couldn't do it, nobody can. No one over there has got the political clout to tell the people, sorry, Here's what we're going to do. We're going to set up a Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza with a link between the two, better than the 67 line, better than that line you saw before. And we're all going to live there. Anyone who wants to come live there is, is welcome. We're going to make this the best state in the Middle East. But you're not going home to Israel. That's your home. That's your home. No Palestinian leader, if Arafat could do it. No Palestinian leader can do that and expect to survive the day. And that's why I think the peace process, and everyone knows you have to say that the peace process is Israel Palestinian. That's why the peace process has reached its logical conclusion twice, 2000, 2008, but didn't bring peace. So why did we keep trying? It ain't going to happen. In my view, and this is an uh, iconoclastic view that you won't hear much of anywhere else, these negotiations by now are a waste of time. The only way there's ever going to be a solution, and it's not going to be peace, it's going to be the way that, the, that NATO solved the Bosnia conflict in the 90s. Hopefully without the bombing that killed 10,000 people. By imposing one. In this case, drawing borders, saying this is Palestine, this is Israel, deal with it. And then maybe after a couple of generations, there might be peace. I don't see an alternative at this point. How are we doing time-wise, uh, organizers? I'm, you know, I've got a, a flight to catch at quarter six in the morning in Indianapolis, so I've got all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Can't read this thing. Yeah, I know. It's on a stopwatch. It's 2304 something. Oh, I get it. It's an hour. It's supposed to help me keep, my, keep, keep myself down to a reasonable length of time. I just keep laughing along. Yes? Exacerbated by the fact that he had to stay inside uh, for years and no sunlight, probably bad food, whatever. Uh, it doesn't matter because so many people believe what they believe. Uh, in the same way, uh, oh, man, wrangles some people here. The whole <clears throat> vaccination connected to autism thing was a faulty study of 14 people which has been retracted. So why do people still believe this? Because they believe it. In the same way that the people who believe that our plot was poisoned, it doesn't matter what you tell them. And we have this whole thing with the polonium on the clothes, which didn't pan out. Turned out to be a total crock. Because there's polonium everywhere, everybody. 
not enough to cause any harm, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it, you know, it, it, it's one of these tragic circumstances, and I'm seeing more and more of them in the world today, uh, where my mind is made up, don't confuse me with facts. Right? And that's, that's, that sums up the Arafa story. Anyone else? Yes? <clears throat> Sir, why is there seems to be a reluctance for news reporters or any of the agencies to cover the fact that generally Palestinians aren't liked by the Arab countries either? You know, mm -hmm. that the Lebanese certainly can't stand them. The Kuwaitis threw them out after the first Gulf War. Even the Iranian public knows that, you know, Palestine isn't their fight. Uh, why is that issue not covered? Well, you know, there were a couple of Palestinian photographers in, in the Bureau in Cairo, and everyone hated their guts. And, and uh, I saw the way they behaved. Uh, Egyptians are very uh, restrained, very polite. And Palestinians, not actually Israelis. <laughs> Uh, I can't answer your question. It, it, it's one of those social issues uh, that, uh, that, that journalists don't get onto for some reason. Uh, it, it's not breaking news, it's not politics, uh, it's not a scandal. I'm aware of it, and obviously you are as well, uh, and the Palestinians certainly are. Um, I don't have an answer why we don't cover them cover the stories. There are lots and lots of stories we don't cover, and that's certainly one. Maybe one more? No, more than one. Yeah, then. Oops, Bill. Oops. Well, Fred, I'm interested in the chapter you had about the lack of political compromise. Mm -hmm. In your opinion, and what you know, is that, could that ever happen over there now? That it hasn't happened for about six years? Yeah, the, 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 the lack of the concept of compromise. Uh, I have linguists who tell me there's no proper word for compromise in Arabic. My Arabic's not good enough to draw that conclusion by myself, but uh, two linguists who do know the language well said, yeah, it's true, there's a, a term for middle position, which is close, but compromise is a, is a concept, it's, it's a, a mindset, there's that word again. Um, and yeah, I definitely do believe, Bill, that the lack of understanding of that concept is what scuttles any chance for democracy in a country like <laughs> Egypt and most other countries in the region because it's the key to democracy after all. If you have a little tiny political party and there are 17 other little tiny political parties and you can't agree on anything, then one large movement, in this case the Muslim Brotherhood, is going to win an election. And that's what happened. Mohamed Morsi, when he ran for president, got 25% of the vote altogether. And that was enough. Because the reformers could not forget their minor differences, and believe me, they were minor, long enough to coalesce behind a candidate. So all the reforming, reformer candidates, and there were bunches of them among the 14 candidates in the first round, None of them finished in the first two. Yet had they coalesced around a single reformist candidate, he would have been in the top two and gone for the second round of elections, which ended up the president. So absolutely, the absence of a concept of how to work a democracy, to which compromise is a key element, how a democracy works, doesn't work in Iraq, doesn't work in Egypt. It works in a weird, strange way in Lebanon, but that's not a real democracy there, it's an ethnic democracy. The only place it works is Israel, and even then you've got to wonder sometimes. Uh, so yes, absolutely, and that's why I said earlier that our obsession with trying to create little democracies around the world is completely misguided. We have no business dictating the form of government to anybody. What we have works for us. It won't necessarily work for anybody else. They've all got to come to their own conclusions about what kind of government they want and what kind of government they can sustain. 
had some experience with various forms and has come along back to the old form of a military dictatorship. And they're all, not all, obviously not all. The Muslim Brotherhood is not real down with this. Uh, and, and reformers are not real down with this either. But the vast majority of Egyptian people are saying if this guy can improve our economy and let us live a better life, then fine. So he's a dictator. Fine. Who cares? And who are we to question that? Maybe one more question. Yes. The story just broke a couple hours ago that the Saudi Arabia came at the left halfway. Any idea of what type of uh, thank you for updating me. I wasn't aware of it. I, I didn't know, and I've seen stories, um, uh, analyses. Uh, so Saudi Arabia's king died, King Abdullah. Um, I don't think it will have immediate effects because they have a very, very strict uh, sense and order of, of succession there. But that whole generation, he's 93, I think, that whole generation is about that old. And so we're going to have a fairly quick succession, I think, of old kings uh, passing along to uh, young, to, to not very much younger kings. <laughs> I don't think uh, we're going to see too much instability there because the royal family uh, has got Saudi Arabia uh, in very tight control. That said, I don't know. Pulled our reporter out of there. <laughs> Didn't we? So, anybody's guess. Uh, but thanks for updating me there. Friends, thanks very much for coming out tonight.